I'm at Facebook um, in, a, in a Novi group, which is sort of like the blockchain financial uh, crowd, and uh, uh, you know, sort of like a little, little tiny little research group there. Um, and I'm going to talk about how to verify that Rust programs don't crash. Um, let's, let's first talk about um, why <laughs> we have um, work going on on the replication. And I think that the, I guess it's kind of obvious to everybody here. But um, so here's a, a pretty recent quote from a, a paper that if you guys haven't seen that, you really should read that. It's a kind of a very well written paper and as a fact, it affects my views very precisely. So uh, thanks, Alistair, for being so very eloquent about um, what I feel about verification. So uh, this is a very recent quote, but um, going back three years ago to the start of the Mirai project, um, things were not very different. So basically there was um, uh, a team of people who decided on the programming language to use to implement um, the uh, blockchain thing, DM. And uh, they ended up choosing Rust, but they um, came to the conclusion that um, Rust was great everywhere except in static analysis. It just didn't compare well to other languages, particularly to, to C and C++ and all the tools available for that. And so they reached out to me while I was um, sitting in Hawaii at exact, this exact spot where my background is um, and said, how do would I like to come and work on static analysis for Rust? And I said, yeah, yes, okay, I'll do that. Um, so that's the origin of the Rust project um, going back almost three years now. I've only been working on it for maybe two and a half, um, but it's uh, started to be a fairly long in the tooth project already. And uh, it still feels like, it feels like fusion like it's always going to be another year and then it will be great. So we're not quite there yet. But okay, so uh, meanwhile, what else is there um, that a Rust program can, can use? Um, so it turns out that the Rust type system is a wondrous thing. And the fact that the Rust standard library is a functional library uh, and the whole Rust ecosystem, the Rust way of doing things and Clippy and all of that stuff means that when you're writing Rust code, you're not really writing a lot of um, the classical bugs and kind of stuff that you see in C++. So it's not this sort of like huge bug fest that static analyzers for C can have. So if you want to, if you're a static analyzer um, writer, C is kind of like your best case. Like it's like it's just like a like there are gold nuggets lying everywhere. If like Every 10 lines of C, there's about 15 bugs or something like that. Um, Rust is not like that. So Rust is really a much more difficult uh, place of doing business. But even so, Rust programs can still terminate abruptly and disgracefully. So uh, hence this workshop and everything we're going to talk about in this workshop. Um, and so let's get to what what mirai uh, what why mirai today so like the, the, the today's view of mirai uh, is that we want to produce you know one of these compiler plugins that uh, nikos has been telling us about uh, so so that it could fit smoothly into cargo and we want to very specifically ingest arbitrary unannotated rust code so just meet the programmers where they are take Rust code as it is, all of it, no exceptions, and produce actionable diagnostics with a very low false positive rate. We want this to run so quickly and efficiently that you can just make it part of your normal workflow. And also should be part of CI and there should be no, there should be no barriers to use of this thing. So um, I guess as all of you can imagine, this is maybe a little bit over ambitious. Uh, we're still nowhere close to doing all of this, but that's kind of our goal. So um, also, I, I guess if um, I want to say that uh, if, I, if we can do this without um, solving any, um, any new novel problems or making research contributions, that's actually a plus point. <laughs> so I'm going to get all of this done, but as um, 
as low risk and as, as easily as possible. Uh, so research is not really the objective here. Um, so how to use Mirai? Um, well, you go to the GitHub. Uh, this is not maybe the most uh, wonderful uh, URL to get there, but if, if you go to the GitHub from the README, you'll get to some page telling you how to in install Mirai, which is a little bit complicated because you have to install uh, Z3 as well, um, but uh, it's all there. Then you just basically build your project without using Mirai. Um, but there is a little caveat. You have to set this damn flag. And so Nikos, please make that flag go away. Uh, or somebody make that flag go away. <laughs> and I will be very thankful. Uh, then you uh, have to touch your main file or the library file. Uh, so we can do some incremental compilation. Now you run cargo again, but this time you tell it to use not Rust C, but uh, the little Mirai wrapper um, that will invoke uh, the callback object and do all of the Mirai things. And then you'll get, um, hopefully it doesn't crash, but sometimes it will, and you'll maybe get some diagnostics that maybe some of them will be useful. Uh, in the future, um, it would be so much nicer if we could just do something like cargo verify, not have to do all of that double building and touching and flags and stuff. So uh, there is really some um, some more work to be done in terms of um, support. I think that uh, Rust has for verification. Okay, so uh, as I've, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we still at least a year away from having a really uh, polished, useful product, I think. Um, maybe a year from now, I'll have to say the same thing. Uh, so if you try out Mirai, um, you really should expect it not to work. Uh, but I would um, like it if you tried out anyways, and um, let me know how it goes. Um, I only ever get negative feedback. Uh, sometimes it's nice to hear if, if something went well. So if you use it, and it actually worked for you. I would just love to hear that. I've not so far had the pleasure of, doing, of, of hearing that from anyone. Um, okay, so what does Mirai actually do? It's essentially just a, um, a reachability analysis. And so it does control flow reachability. So basically, um, if there is some way starting from a starting point to flow through the program to some to a panic, it will tell you about it and say, hey, do you know your program can panic uh, if you follow this path through the program? And um, it also does data flow reachability. So basically, um, as part of the analysis, it's tracking values. And so um, you get to um, add tags to values. And so the uh, analysis will be able to track data as it flows from variable to variable and via expressions. And you get to control exactly how it flows through expressions. And then you can check whether uh, this tag data reaches a, a sync. And uh, if tag data shouldn't get there or gets there without the tag that you want, then you can give a diagnostic with a precondition. Uh, there are also implicit channels, um, for example, timing channels that uh, people uh, are concerned about for uh, uh, security analysis. So you can also, there's also an option to say that if tag data flows into any kind of uh, uh, condition that is used to uh, control control flow, that you can call that an error so that uh, you can do things like constant time analysis. So if you have, say, crypto algorithms where they don't want the runtime of the crypto algorithm to be uh, influenced by the secret key in any way, you can uh, build a check uh, using this uh, data flow analysis, reachability analysis. Uh, so basically, uh, data control flow, reachability, and data flow analysis, and data flow reachability is just very primitive, um, basic forms of um, analysis. So uh, you can do all sorts of other things um, like code injection, leaking of secrets and 
you can basically build whatever analysis that you are truly that you are actually wanting to do or that's interesting for your particular app, uh, thing by building on top of this basic analysis and typically you would um, then need to start making use of annotations and custom tags and there's a crate in crates io called mirai annotations it has a whole bunch of um, macros of which these are the um, of like the principal ones that you can um, put into your program to sort of like um, build up uh, um, custom analysis if that's what you're trying to do. So basically, we all know about pre and post conditions, verify is kind of like a cert. Uh, you can also um, help the prover by adding assumptions, and then you can do uh, control data flow analysis with add tag and hashtag, and you can also uh, model, do have model state by setting model fields and looking at model fields. Okay. Um, so I said that we want to um, make Mirai work as, as well as possible for arbitrary, uh, unannotated Rust code and keep um, false positives down to the to a bare minimum. So uh, since we are reporting every time there's a panic or you can reach a panic, um, well, most panics in Rust programs, or at least the ones I've been looking at, are intentional checks that parameter values are same. Um, so you don't want to um, point out to a programmer, hey, you've checked your parameter for validity, because uh, that's not really uh, going to get you a lot of love from the people using the tool. So um, also these checks um, sometimes are just implicit. Um, uh, a programmer will just uh, put in an index into some array and say, okay, it's, uh, you don't call me of a bad index, or don't call me with, um, uh, it'll, it'll unwrap a value, an optional value, and say, don't call me with something that is not unwrappable. Uh, so a lot of these checks are implicit and pretty far away from uh, any public API function. Um, so um, if you want to do things really properly, you'll annotate the public API function with explicit preconditions that will make sure that no um, panics can actually happen once you pass the preconditions. But um, and this is kind of like uh, how I always thought things should be done because it adds, and it, uh, adds nice documentation and so on. And it's very explicit what it's trying to do. But uh, in practice, it, uh, at least the uh, Rust programmers that I've been working with um, find all of this annotations to be very redundant and verbose and they push back against this. So in the spirit of meeting programmers where they are, um, Basically, we want the analysis to um, infer preconditions that will preclude these panics. So instead of issuing a diagnostic when you find that there's a path leading to a panic, if it's possible, you want to just produce a, a precondition that precludes the panic. And so uh, by inferring these preconditions and just adding them to summaries of the functions that you analyze, uh, you will not produce any diagnostics for that. Let me just make um, an adjustment to my screen. If I can find my cursor. I can't read my speaker notes because it's blocked by my... Um, <laughs> by the little pictures, but okay, I can't find my cursor. Um, okay, so... Um, the other part of keeping false positives down is to make the um, analysis as precise as possible um, and as general as possible. So uh, it, it's basically um, not a modular analysis, like I'm, again, sort of the, what I was used to with Microsoft Research. We were always, the religion was you do modular analysis because it's the only way to scale and be fast and stuff. But so uh, the analysis, is, uh, to be precise, is it starts at an entry point. And from there on, you want to basically uh, traverse the call graph and you want to resolve every function call. 
so that you can get a precise summary of its behavior uh, and which you can then specialize, specialize with the call site um, information such as the actual arguments. So um, resolving functions um, is not always possible, um, but it turns out that we can do it often enough um, so that when we start from an entry point and we just carry down the core graph, uh, most functions can be resolved and the, the uh, analysis can be useful. Um, so uh, that constrains what can be an entry point. So basically an entry point is, can be the main function of a binary or it can be a public function of a library, but it has to be non-generic um, and it has to be first order because um, analyzing a function that has um, parameters that are maybe traits for which you can call or has function first or higher order and so you have function parameters. If you don't know what those functions are, you can't resolve the calls to those functions. You don't know what the summaries are. And then the analysis basically breaks down. Another potentially good place to start um, analysis is unit tests. So um, I think one of the, um, uh, the ways that we really need to go with um, static analysis for, um, for Rust is to really um, start with unit tests and uh, essentially use uh, the symbolic reasoning capabilities to um, uh, traverse not just the, uh, the specific um, values in the unit tests, but, but the entire value space and all of the paths through it. Okay, so let's see. So uh, we start with an entry point, traverse down it, and we get to a function call. The function is summarized on demand. Um, and then the summary is cached. If we don't cache the uh, summaries, we'll end up uh, in uh, exponential um, explosions of, of the runtime and the analysis of real programs will become infeasible. Um, but uh, don't summarize a function just once, uh, particularly the generic functions. We, uh, it's like a concretization in a compiler. Make up the key of the concrete types, the actual arguments, the function pointers are reachable from parameters, the concrete types of any trait fields reachable from parameters, and so on. Uh, and uh, then um, summarize the function, being able to hopefully uh, resolve all function calls. Uh, and then uh, the future use if we see this kind of uh, invocation again. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there are still some function calls that do not resolve for various reasons. And there are also a lot of function calls um, that you reach this way that actually have no mirror. Um, some of them is inevitable because those are foreign function calls just to uh, wrap C++ functions or to intrinsics. Um, in other cases, it's because we're calling something in the standard library and the dear uh, Rust compiler writers in their infinite wisdom have decided that um, quite a few of the functions of the standard library will be stored in the uh, libraries without Mir. So uh, you do get um, in practice to a lot of functions where there is no Mir. So um, there are ways in the um, analyzer to, uh, there are ways to write uh, summaries for these functions by hand and the uh, um, the analyzer is, um, let's go to the next slide for that. So the, um, the analyzer is bundled with a bunch of built-in functions for some of the intrinsics and uh, uh, foreign functions that we know about. Um, and programmers are also able to add their own uh, handwritten summaries for maybe foreign functions that they call. Uh, but um, in practice, the analysis will still uh, quite often get to a function for which there's no mirror and no summary. And then basically all bits are off. And now the question is what to do. Um, so this, fun this unknown function could panic. It could have preconditions. Uh, it could even call back to the code via a function parameter. Um, it can have all sorts of side effects. Um, 
and it can have established post conditions that we would like to use. And so uh, all of these, the, the lack of knowledge about all of these things basically means that when you get to a function that you couldn't resolve, you're kind of in a very bad state for the analysis. Um, and there's not really a lot that the, um, the programmers that want to run MIUI on their code can do about this because it's you kind of reach this point in some third party library or a standard library or um, in some situation where it's very far removed from the code that um, uh, is being analyzed. And so um, what we want to do is um, not just say, okay, uh, hey, uh, there's a problem here, uh, tough. Um, we'd like to uh, carry on with the analysis as far as possible uh, and reduce um, false positives. So basically um, the technique um, that I've settled on is, um, if you look at the path condition to the function call, so um, if it's, possible for the caller of the function to uh, avoid calling this missing function at all, um, then um, they shouldn't be bothered with a diagnostic. So basically we pr promote the path condition of such function calls into preconditions. And then if uh, at the uh, call site, it turns out that that path um, that contains the function function is never actually called, then there won't be a diagnostic for it and you're not overloading the programmer with a message that they really care about and can't do anything about. Okay, so I think I've uh, talked about this. So one um, case that I often see with um, functions that are uh, missing um, uh, but don't matter is um, if you call a function with an argument that is of some kind of trait, uh, but it's actually an optional uh, um, value. And you're calling it with none. Then uh, at the call site, you haven't specified what the type of T is. And so you can't um, analyze the uh, function with a known type for that trait. So when you analyze the function, you get to the trait call uh, for the sum case, and uh, that's not resolvable, and now you would normally give a diagnostic. But by making it into a precondition, because if I go back to the call site, you see, oh, the call site actually supplies none. So it turns out that the precondition, which in this case is that the function should not be summed, is honored by the fact that the actual argument is none, and you can then suppress the bug. You don't need a, a false positive in terms of uh, you may be calling this unknown function because it never actually does get called from that call site. Okay, so uh, coming to uh, just a little bit of a few words about the internals of MIUI. Okay, so we all know what MIR is. So, so uh, the AI part of MIUI stands for abstract interpretation. And it is fair to call MIUI an abstract interpreter, but that's not the whole story. Uh, the abstract interpreter is instantiated with a domain that actually tracks symbolic expressions rather than the more classical uh, ways of doing abstract interpretation. So it's also fair to call MIUI a symbolic execution engine, but there's more. Um, one of the things to notice is that symbolic expressions um, have this habit of growing exponentially in size. So um, and there's extensive support within Mirai for constant folding and algebraic sim simplification while it is running this interpretation phase. But when we get to um, an actual proof obligation, when a uh, decision has to be made about whether a code block with a panic is reachable or not, then um, the residual path condition, if it is not a constant because of constant folding and simplification at this point, is actually translated into an expression for an SMT solver. Uh, so um, you can also think of Mirai as being a more classical SMT sol solver based um, theorem proving kind of uh, system. So it's kind of like a hybrid of all of these things. 
Um, the interpreter works by uh, tracking the values of, uh, of variables or fields by means of a functional map of path value pairs. Near terms paths are essentially a places and uh, values are essentially operands. And um, it uses a functional map so that we can basically keep uh, lots of copies of these things for various program points uh, as we do the fixed point computations. Um, and the values in this uh, data structure is um, basically just containers for the symbolic expressions. But when a symbolic expression gets too large, it gets wider, and then we compute um, additional abstract values such as intervals. And uh, we also do this to any symbolic simplific algebraic simplifications. Um, and this is very heuristic bottom up and shallow, so it's, it's kind of uh, effective. And uh, most path values are really um, concrete uh, rather than abstract. It's, it's, but, uh, abs when they do become abstract, we do have to worry about aliasing. And so there's a lot of complexity around uh, updating the environment in such a way that we uh, take care of aliasing. Okay, then there's also a bunch of uh, K limits that um, limit um, things from getting too big, particularly for symbolic expressions, so that the analysis will not uh, diverge. Uh, in the future, I don't want to do more formal work so, uh, supporting parameterized in the tests. It will also be nice if we can take the uh, uh, models from the SMT solver and uh, synthesize counterexamples um, when we are saying that there's a awesome test case. Uh, when we find that there's a panic that might be reachable. Uh, we'd like to make, make it really easy for people to use Murai uh, in their project by simply making publishing a GitHub action. Uh, like to have human readable function summaries and have much better ID integration at some point. So these are all things that hopefully will happen in the future. Uh, okay. So for all of you out there, um, help wanted. Um, I know uh, most people working on Rust verification at the moment have got their own private infrastructures that have been working on for decades. And um, Rust is just like another feather in their cap. Um, and um, the, that's the, the right thing to do, particularly when you come at it from a research perspective. But once you get an interesting result, uh, maybe consider porting that into Mirai. Um, certainly would be very happy for you to try and do that and give you all the help I can. Uh, and even just using Mirai in your own code will also be very helpful. And uh, uh, the other thing that I think all of us will benefit from enormously is if we can come up with a common set of test cases or benchmarks that are all uh, ver verification tools can run against. And uh, keeping this workshop going and um, um, having more of them in the future, I think is also a good thing to do. So that's kind of like all I have to say. Um, run a little bit over, I'm afraid. So yeah, I, we're a little over. I don't, I don't want to take any questions, but there was one question in the chat that maybe I throw at you, and then we'll go to the next okay. talk, and then we can follow later. It says uh, Daniel Schwartz Narbonne asked, "How do you handle the standard library? Do you use a model or the concrete code?" The concrete code, uh, and then models for all of the stuff where the uh, mirror, uh, Rust compiler devs have, to, have been have decided not to give me mirror. <laughs> yes. In Which please, 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 please fix that. <laughs> Just okay. to throw in one brick comment here, Miri, not to be confused with Mirai, has also mm. needs Mir for everything. And we have some pretty good ways to do that. So uh, happy to talk if you want to know more about what we are doing. I would love to hear this. Yeah, that sounds like a useful follow on item. Um, all right. So if you can end your screen share, Herman will move to the next talk.